Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Top Gun, we're following Meg Ryan to inner space. <laughs> In your space, we are going to follow Dennis Quaid to the right stuff. Right stuff, we are following Ed Harris to Apollo 13. Bill Paxton from Apollo 13 to the President 2. Then uh, Adam Baldwin to Independence Day. Welcome to the road to Independence Day! Three challengers! Apollo mission was launched. A million things could have gone wrong. Our next broadcast will be from the surface of the moon. One did. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. We got a wicked shimmy up here. Houston, we are venting something out into space. It's definitely a gas of some sort. If this is Houston, say again, please. It must be the oxygen. You see what I see? Fight. Their heart rates are skyrocketing. We have a 401 alarm. That can't be real. Oh, uh, man, it is fighting me. Jack, what's the story there? I, I, I keep losing radio signal. That can't happen. It's got to be instrumentation. And we got some serious time pressure here. We're looking at less than 15 minutes of life support left. It's like they're all over the place. Damn, we're losing it. We never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. episode that's right nine episodes but we finally got there we get it yep shut it down guys shut it down yep we did it mission accomplished yep podcast goals over yep shut it down kevin bacon we made it Woo! bacon tom you're supposed to be doing the intro yeah tom come on we're waiting uh, yeah we're I, waiting I, I, oh that's, <clears throat> hello i'm tom british name thompson and welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Fire Pit Podcast, our ninth episode spectacular. Last week, we capped off a Friday with the amazing film, The Right Stuff, which was a film about the beginnings of the space race. Uh, tonight, we take Ed Harris, who played John Glenn in that movie, and connect him to this film as we continue on the road to Independence Day, all the way to that 1996 summer blockbuster starring Vivica Fox and some other people you may or may not have heard of. But to tell us about those connections and what we're about to watch tonight, I pass the mic off to Josh. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. You're very welcome. Hello, hello. I'm Reginald, American name Josh. And as Tom said, our connector from last week is uh, Mr. Ed Harris. And tonight, we'll get to watch him go from astronaut, where he played John Glenn, to flight director Gene Krantz and uh, Apollo 13. This film is about the most successful moon mission failure that occurred in 1970. Um, it was the third mission to the moon, and people did feel that it was getting routine by this point, because, you know, we already won. So naturally, 13 was uh, going to be the bad luck one, right? So this movie stars Bill Paxton, Gary Sinise, and see some Kevin Bacon and Tom Hanks. Quick side note. Do you think when Tom Hanks signs an autograph that he uh, signs it T. Hanks so it just looks like thanks? If he doesn't, he should start. Yeah. So if Tom Hanks on the off chance he ever listens to this ever, yes, he should start doing that. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. I mean, that would just be brilliant on his part. It's like, you just wrote thanks. It's like, I know. T. Hanks. Okay. 
So our um, <laughs> our route to get to Apollo 13 today comes from, like I said earlier, we're following Ed Harris, who was also in The Right Stuff, where we followed uh, Dennis Quaid from Inner Space, where we followed Meg Ryan from Top Gun, where we followed Michael Ironside from Starship Troopers, following Clancy Brown to Pathfinder, following The Rock to Doom, following Wait. Carl Urban to Pathfinder to Doom. And uh, there were some other movies in there too, but I forgot to write those down. Because I imagine <laughs> after the first couple of them, you just started uh, nodding off. Anywho. So, <laughs> to give a rundown on this week's movie, I will pass it to Dan. Dan? Thank you, Josh. I'm Dan, British name Nigel. And gentlemen, this is an important episode. Even though it's not the point of this podcast, we do a variation of the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. And this is the first film that we've covered that has Kevin Bacon in it. Wait, wait, what? Even wait, though that's no not shit. the end goal. What? The, that's not the end goal. The end goal of the podcast isn't what? to always find a Kevin Bacon movie, but we do a variation of the, 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 the game where we pick an actor or an actress and we go to another movie and we connect them and we have an end goal in mind, just like the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. So our end goal is the road to Independence Day and we found Kevin Bacon in the road to Independence Day, but my like bacon. So Dude, I think man, we I didn't even think about that. I, saw I know, the guy's name. I know, and That's we really crazy. should. I just, I just said the whole. I know I, it's not the goal, but we really need to what, take a moment to reflect this. Wait, what's happening? Seriously, Tom, can you believe? Like I, I, I just got done. Saying didn't that. you? Yeah, Kevin, Kevin Bacon. Bacon yeah, yeah, finally. Yeah, I, yeah. I just got done saying that though. Yeah, yeah. No, you didn't. And so how some five minutes ago about... I just said that. So anywho, go continue, Dan. Sorry to well, interrupt. Oh my God, I think I'm going insane. So as mentioned before, we're watching Apollo 13 tonight. A great film. Uh, some notes trivia tidbits about this movie let's see here well it's a historical drama so it's based on a real story it's actually kind of funny that if uh, the the actual recordings between apollo 13 and mission control are actually available to the public you can listen to them if you want and if you do you'll notice some of the bits of the dialogue from this movie but you'll also notice that it's incredibly boring to listen to <laughs> um, because even though all three of these astronauts lives were very much on the line and there was a very real possibility they could die uh, they never lose their cool not once mission control never loses their cool the astronauts never lose their cool the drama in this movie had to be added because ron howard even admitted that if he just did a blow by blow script of the audio from Mission Control to Apollo 13, it would have been a snooze fest. Yeah, they took have a whole bunch of professionals who actually know their job and are good at doing it. Yeah, it's it's kind of an amazing. Um, just some little bits of trivia I picked up while researching this movie. Any PC gamers that are in the audience, uh, for, would note that for a long time the video game Crisis was the benchmark for your graphics. If your if your computer could hold Crisis at top line graphics, uh, top resolution, then you had a great graphics card. You had a great PC build. Well. When this film came out in the 90s on VHS and Laserdisc, does anyone remember Laserdisc? George uh, Lucas does. <laughs> George Lucas remembers Laserdisc. Um, George Lucas has now blocked us on Twitter. Yeah, the movie launch sequence when the rocket is launching from the launch pad into space, this was kind of like a benchmark if you had a home theater system. Like how well could your home theater system handle the uh, launch of Apollo 13 because it would uh, rumble if you had a really good system uh, it would rumble it. I remember my uncle Paul got himself a uh, really nice rig and invited us over to watch this movie and totally flexed when the rocket was launching. That's just one little tidbit. Uh, another thing is Gary Sinise is in this movie. Lieutenant Dan, to those who aren't familiar with all of his work. He's also... Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's Lieutenant Dan. Also, he was he was on uh, one of the CSI, CSI New York, for several years. So he's, in, you know, and he does a lot of work with veterans and the Army. He does. He's also the voice of all the Army commercials. Anyways, Gary Sinise plays Ken Mattingly in this movie, and they actually have the same birthday, March 17th. So, oh. yeah, they're both born on St. Patrick's Day. And... Another little bit was that slide rules only multiply and divide. They don't actually do addition and subtraction. But the reason why in the scene when they're doing some math and they're actually mostly just doing addition and subtraction, the reason why they're using slide rules mm -hmm. is because Ron Howard knew that pocket calculators hadn't been invented yet and he wanted to show the audience how smart the engineers are. Because oh. it's a tool, yeah, it's a tool that's usually associated with engineering with with smart people. Slide rules are, you know. So, so in the meta of that scene, they they're doing that on the windows, and the other guys are looking like, dude, are you wait, what are you doing? That's that's not how that goes. Yeah, it was definitely added for dramatic effect, but it works. Mm -hmm. it, it actually works. It really does hammer home 
how uh, smart they were figuring that out on their own but no calculators and no computers remember the apollo 13 was you know that's this is the 70s there well, were they no had computers. computers they were just the size of a bomb. okay I, you know what i mean they didn't have they didn't have what we have today our smartphones have more computing power than everything that was inside that spaceship. So just another couple of little bits of trivia. I didn't want to go through. I made a long list, but I don't know if I'll go through all of it. But this was a long string of critically acclaimed award-winning films starring Tom Hanks. They included Philadelphia, Forrest Gump, Saving Private Ryan, The Green Mile. Pretty much banging out a big, critical, successful movie every summer or every fall for the last few years. Mm -hmm. And this, then this was in that group that kind of cemented Tom Hanks is a, a lot of our audience will, if you mention Tom Hanks, they'll probably think of these movies and they think of him as a serious dramatic actor in very serious dramatic roles. It's kind of hard to imagine that in the eighties and the early nineties, he was mostly known for comedies. He was kind of like the prototype Will Smith for the summer blockbusters. Yeah. Except he, unlike Will Smith, he didn't just do action films. Tom Hanks was doing very critically acclaimed story driven dramatic movies like Philadelphia where he played somebody fired for having AIDS and then Forrest Gump mm -hmm. um, where he basically was a, a recap of American history from the 50s, 60s and 70s. You know, Saving Private Ryan, you know, World War II movie, uh, The Green Mile, um, another movie, another dramatic. I once read somewhere or maybe I heard that it, actually Tom Hanks almost didn't get the role that the um, I think the guy that he plays actually wanted um kevin costner to play him um according to jim lovell himself that's true because and if you do look at young jim hovell or jim lovell what he looked like in the 70s when this was when uh, when this happened he mm. does kind of bear more of a resemblance to kevin costner than tom hanks but oh, yeah they definitely didn't take into account the actual astronauts looks when they did cast yeah um he Gary did, sinise looks nothing like ken no Daly. No, he doesn't. And Bill Paxton doesn't, you know, doesn't look like. I would say Bill Paxton looks more like Fred yeah. Hayes. Yeah. The only one I think that really comes close is I do think Ed Harris looks a little more like Gene Krantz than the other actors do look like the parts they're playing. But that's I think my some opinion. of the mission control guys like they got them because they yeah. show pictures at the end of the movie. Yeah, but Ron Howard really wanted Tom Hanks for the role pretty much from the moment the the script writing phase of this movie was being played. Wait, in. this is directed by Ron <clears throat> Howard, the same guy who directed Solo, the best of the Star Wars movies. Okay, Josh, you need to leave. You just <laughs> never come back. <laughs> yes, um, it's directed. We all know your opinion doesn't count. It's directed by the same Ron Howard. <laughs> Most famous for being Andy Griffith's son. And for nothing else. <laughs> yeah, nothing else other than being an Andy Griffith's son. Yeah, but anyways, yeah, Kevin Costner, uh, that's who Jim Lovell really wanted to play him. And yes, Kevin Costner does look more like Jim Hubble did in the 70s. That's, you know, he does. And I don't know if the movie still would have been as good if Costner had been Lovell. But Ron Howard really, really, really wanted Tom Hanks for the role. And the people, I think he had to be talked into it. I think... Lovell kind of had to be like talked into it. And he ended up loving the movie anyways. Um, and Jim Lovell actually does have a cameo in the movie. He's the, the admiral on the um, aircraft carrier that greets him when they finally splash down. So it's hard to imagine there's a universe out there where Tom Hanks was not the lead in this film. He, yeah, he, it, it's kind of hard. Like, you know, younger audiences don't probably don't know that he got his start in comedy. He was in comedy roles. I mean, he got his start in acting on a sitcom, Bosom Buddies, for years before he got into mo movies. And then he was in Turner and Hooch, The Money Pit, Burbs, A League of Their Own, Big. Those movies are kind of comedies. And in the case of Big and Splash, they're dramedies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to imagine him as a comedy actor when he's done all of these dramatic roles. And that's what we think of him now. Especially for younger people that think of Tom Hanks. They either think... Wilson. They think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they think Wilson. Yeah, they think Castaway. They think Forrest Gump, or they might even think Woody from Toy Story because he's been the voice of Woody for all the Toy Story movies. Yeah. Because I mean, he he won Oscars for Forrest Gump and Philadelphia. He should have won an Oscar for Saving Private Ryan. Um, you know, he, so he's been in all these big movies and and all these great roles and these critically acclaimed roles that it's kind of hard to imagine that. He used to be in comedies, and he was really good in comedies too. The Money Pit's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. Well, he's a great he's, actor. He's one of those who I would call a good actor. Yeah, or he's a great a... actor. Like it's like we mentioned, or I know I mentioned last week, right? Like how like you get one actor in two different roles and they're indistinguishable. Whereas you yeah, get yeah. Bruce Willis, he's the same guy in every movie he's in. 
pretty much sad Bruce Willis or angry Bruce Willis. Those are yeah. your two options. And and this movie actually sparked Tom Hanks, if I'm not mistaken. I, I might be wrong, but I know that this movie definitely lit a spark in Tom Hanks about um his love of the space program. And that's why he actually narrated the documentary from Earth to the Moon. And um he's been a big advocate for getting us back into space and getting space exploration uh, going again. Mm-hmm. So yeah. More power to it. Thanks, Tom Hanks. <laughs> See, that's why you should sign his autographs that way. Hanks. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> well, Tom, if you're uh, listening, not you, Tom. Good, the, the good Tom. We love you, and you're always welcome on our podcast. You, you think he'll he'll uh, hear that, guys? You, you think oh, I'm I'm right? sure he's pushing his way past all these bots that are listening to us right uh, now. All six of our bots, right? Seven by this point. So now you're going to do the rundown? Didn't it, wasn't this all just the rundown? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Yes, the rundown, the rundown. Apollo 13 was released on June 30th, 1995. So good God, this movie's almost 20 years old, exactly. Or I mean, uh, not 20 years old, 1995. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong date. <laughs> My bad. Jeez. Yeah. yeah, this movie's, wow, this movie's really that old now? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, so... Came out on June 30th, 1995, obviously uh, mentioned before, directed by Ron Howard. It had a budget of $52 million, which um, actually did the studio a little nervous because that was ballooned from the initial uh, budget of $30 million. And then it ended up being $52 million. So the studio was very, very nervous, but their fears were uh, subsided when the movie box office returns topped at about $355.2 million. So... Nice little return on investment. Yeah, definitely a good good way to spend their money, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then just like last week, uh, it's very critically acclaimed. Uh, it has a 96% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, uh, 87% critic, I think, 97.6% audience. But that's really, really high, and it's just a fantastic film. Like I said, I can't really say that much else about it other than just how- I do have a bit of trivia so, on it, too. Go ahead. Like all of the uh, weightless scenes in this movie are actually filmed weightless, not in space. They were filmed on the uh, vomit comet, which if you're not familiar with the vomit comet, it is a basically a big empty plane where they had the sets built on the of the lunar module and the command module in in it. And it basically would fly up and do giant par- parabolic arcs. And when they and as it would uh, descend you would get the feeling of weightlessness. Now, you can actually pay to go on plane rides to do these. It's like $2,000 a pop, though. But the fun fact about this is all three of the actors in this movie have more time on the Vomit Comet than pretty much any astronaut in history. Yes, because they had, to, they had to go up and down quite a few times yes. because they were actually only able to get, like I think, a, a couple of minutes of footage per weightless attempt. Oh, it's, so. You only get 30 seconds at a time. Gee, so they Christmas. had to film that in 30-second increments. I don't remember yeah. the exact one, but I think it was like over, probably going to get this wrong, but like between 300 uh, arcs that they had to do. And that thing isn't it isn't easy on the stomach. No, I can imagine not. Well, I imagine with a nickname, the Vomit Comet, it probably yeah. isn't. So. <sighs> A lot of drama, I mean, for this film. Oh my yeah. lord! Yeah. Well, that's one like because, and that's one thing that always gets me about movies is they just never get the weightlessness right. Like you can tell that they're just like holding up an actor or something, and the something's just always off with it. It's like yeah, they're the obviously only, under gravity, but the this only one, movie, it's like feels real because they are actually weightless. Yeah, the only movie I could think of where the weightlessness didn't look too bad was. Um, a movie that came out way before this one, but it was a Disney film called uh, The Black Hole. Yeah. And at the beginning, at the beginning of the movie, they're on a, a ship that doesn't have gravi- artificial gravity, so they float between the decks, and it actually looks pretty good. And apparently, according to the notes from that movie, they wanted to use the vomit comet, but at the time the Black Hole was being filmed, it wasn't available to the public. It wasn't available at all, so um, they weren't able to use the vomit comet. So they had a special harnesses attached to the actors and actresses to let them float. But that got real expensive, so that's why when uh, in the movie The Black Hole, when they get to the space station, they had to add in the script. It's got artificial gravity <laughs> so, <laughs> because it was just expensive to use those harnesses. So they're like, okay, yeah, it's got artificial gravity. Yeah. But and like some movies do artificial gravity better than others. I would say The Martian did a really good job of it. Mm-hmm. Um, space Cowboys did a really surprisingly good job of it. Like I remember point looking at it, and it's obvious that they're not in there in certain scenes. But like in that movie, what they did was they put them on like a teeter totter, and they would kind of have somebody managing them as they were sitting on it. So 
they were kind of bobbing. Other movies that are really bad, as far as their weightlessness goes, Armageddon and its sister, Deep Impact. Like, <laughs> Deep Impact was, I just recently rewatched this one. And there's this one scene where the astronauts are there, and they, they got one astronaut who's kind of on her side, floating uh, horizontally or parallel with the ground, and everybody else is kind of sitting. It's painfully obvious that she is being suspended because her hair is like hanging down mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's bad. So it's like, I really appreciate this movie's attention to detail that they actually got the weightlessness literally perfect. That's cool. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why the movie's so successful is because it's so accurate as far as both the story of the mission goes, the science behind the Apollo missions and the moon landing. And uh, in fact, just a little little tidbit little thing that you don't even think of is there's a sequence in the movie where tom hanks his character jim lovell has a dream that he landed on the moon and he's he's walking on the moon and his steps are really awkward and do not accurately represent an actual person walking on the moon it looks like he's got way too much gravity whereas the moon would have a lot less gravity but it it doesn't look right It, it actually doesn't look accurate for someone landing on the moon and it was later on revealed that the reason why his steps are so awkward and they didn't even bother trying to be accurate is that is that because jim lovell never actually landed on the moon he wouldn't know what it's like to step on the moon he would only know secondhand stories from his fellow astronauts that did land on the moon yep uh. jim lovell was um i believe the first astronaut to have second it was a second trip to the moon yes Yep, because he was also the uh, lunar module pilot, which is effectively the second in command of uh, the Apollo missions. Um, or no, the command module pilot is the second in command. The lunar module pilot's actually the third, uh, if you do pay attention to that. But uh, he was uh, not the commander, but he was on the Apollo 8, which was the first mission, first anything uh, manned mission to the moon. So yeah. that, was, that was kind of the USA flexing to uh, Russia that their rocket sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah also it's funny that uh because the three men in the the movie uh or in the the apollo 13 mission i should say not the movie because it's like i said it's a real story the three men didn't land on the moon uh they had to go around the moon and slingshot around it so they could use the moon's gravity to get back to earth the reason uh, because they didn't land on the moon they still to this day the three of them hold the record for being the humans furthest away from earth <laughs> and it was no. also uh the shortest of the manned apollo missions that includes the ones that didn't leave earth orbit a heck of a way to get some records there yeah Yeah. and if i want to say they're also and i could be wrong so please fact check me on this one they're the fastest astronauts because at one point when they were firing their rockets for a return trans earth injection burn on the far side of the moon they had sped up so fast that they are actually and this partly contributed to them being the farthest away from the Earth, but they became the fastest astronauts, the fastest traveled astronauts at that time. I'm not sure if that record's been broke or not. I wouldn't know if it has been or not, but uh, it definitely sounds legit. And yeah, like I said, I think that's why the movie's so so good, because it's, it's so accurate. Apparently, uh, a few years ago, recently, actually, I think when one of the anniversaries of this movie, Ron Howard said one of the reasons why they paid such close attention to detail and made it as accurate as possible is because they figured that by the time we actually go to the moon again, most people that can actually remember the Apollo missions and most of the people that worked on the Apollo missions will be gone. Mm-hmm. So most people's experience with the Apollo missions will be this film. <laughs> and You know, that's just good movie making. Like, yeah. love them or hate them, James Cameron. Avatar, I believe, was so successful in part because of good advertising, but um, (laughs) James Cameron's ability to build a very immersive environment. Like, we all agree that the story on Avatar isn't the strongest story. It's got a relatively simple plot, and but what it grosses you in that movie is, like, the environments. Like, he spent a lot of time making sure that boxes would be moved and the handles wouldn't protrude too far, so they would fit through the doorways of all their structures mm-hmm. uh, inside the buildings because, you know, they couldn't, you, 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 you want to make sure that these boxes are going to fit. You just, a lot of attention to detail like that really adds to that level of immersion. I know when I'm watching a movie, especially more, uh, cause I'm no space scientist or whatever, but I could consider myself a space aficionado. 
Yeah, you're definitely okay. an amateur. You're definitely an amateur yeah. space historian, space scientist, and all that. Yes. So. And so when something comes out of the ordinary for me, it's like totally breaks my immersion. Like I said, the the gravity when I mentioned earlier, it's like if it's got bad gravity effects, I'm just like torn from it. Or like <laughs> the movie Gravity. Speaking of. <laughs> I can't watch that movie again because I know that um, that the, the Hubble, Hubble telescope oh, and the is, IS or the yeah. International Space Station are not neighbors. Nope, nope. The Hubble's actually at like an altitude of three hundred and sixty some odd miles. Yeah. The ISS is like at one hundred and sixty or something. So, and they are completely different orbits. And it would actually be more efficient to land on the Earth and take another rocket up yeah. than to change than to change orbits while in orbit. Jiminy Christmas. Yeah. yeah, the movie makes it seem like the uh, Hubble telescope and the International Space Station are like right next to each other. Mm-hmm. It, they're very much not. Like, I, I think there's a trope for that, actually. It's called sci-fi writers have no sense of scale because yeah. they don't, some don't really get a grasp of just how big and empty space really is. There's a reason why it's called space. So. Yeah. In fact, that one uh, preview for Prometheus a few years back where he's like, we're about 100 like a hundred, oh, he said 500 million. billion miles from home. And someone said that would put you about at Jupiter, buddy. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> was a, that was Neil deGrasse Tyson, like 500, uh, it was 500 million or something like that. But yeah, yeah that would put you uh, just past Jupiter's orbit. Space is big and hard, guys. Yeah, because yeah. If you're looking at this, Earth is 93 million miles on average. That's one AU, is about 93 million miles. And that's how we measure it as an astronomical unit, so AU. Mars is about 4 AU, and Jupiter is, I think, 5 to 6 AU, and it just keeps getting farther and farther and farther from there. Like, yeah. I did look these up, so again, I don't research this for a living, I just watch a lot of YouTube videos, uh, <laughs> and I read books, but uh, it's like, so 2 AU would be, oh, 186 million miles, right? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's crazy how big space is. Like, there's more distance between... Uh, Neptune and Saturn than there is between all of the uh, inner planets. It's kind of funny how they have no no real sense of um, just how big space is. And uh, one thing I did like about this movie is uh, speak, uh, going in the opposite direction. They did a really good job in this movie of showing just how small and cramped the um, Apollo modules were. Uh, you are literally right on top of each other. So... <laughs> I have a couple other thoughts, too, about this film and all the effects and everything, but I want to save some of my thoughts for the end of this film because I'm excited. I am, I have not seen this film in, like, 10 years or something like that. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this again. I think it's been, like, three months. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, was well, one of my – this is still one of my favorite movies of all time. I, oh, and, yeah. And in that uh, aforementioned um, string of – Tom Hanks movies that where he did nothing but dramas for several summers. This and Saving Private Ryan are probably my two favorites. So shall we get started with the movie? Yeah. Yeah. yeah before we break our arms, jerking ourselves off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh, I believe you're the leader tonight. So I let's, am. let's get this party going. Tom, cue the music. To the fire pit. I am your interspersal host, editor, and ground control operator, Tom. You better check your vector, because things are starting to heat up. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on uh, another leg of our road to Independence Day. Uh, we're rounding the corner uh, on the halfway point here. Uh, goals in sight. Uh, we're still not sure what's coming next, uh, whether we're just going to jump right into the next... Uh, leg of roads and such, or if we're just going to keep flying by the seats of our pants for a while, but you know, we'll figure it out when we get there. No news or ads today, but if you want to shoot us a line, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com and just put in the subject line whether you have a comment or a question something that you know popped into your head or maybe you have a recommendation for a movie or a route we can or should take a actor actress whomever to kind of as use as a jumping off point and we'll be sure to glance at it and then never give it a response because your thoughts and opinions matter 
but not all that much. Again, that's Curtain Call Entertainment INC, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. That's it for me. I'll turn you loose as we slingshot around this break and send you back to the podcast. Thanks for listening, and as always, good luck. Well, that's, gentlemen, it has been a privilege watching this with you. It has been an honor going on this voyage to the moon and back with both of you as well. All right, who wants to lead off on the thoughts on this film? Final thoughts. Uh, well, you know what, Tom? You said you had some thoughts you wanted to wait till the end of the movie. Um, why don't you go? Well, I think we are all going to have some similar lanes here. I'm going to start with something I'm actually a little i'm not going to say disappointed in but just in terms of the drama i know we've noted uh this film did dramatize things uh a bit from the actual recordings and everything otherwise it would have sounded like guys reading off a phone book <laughs> yeah <laughs> but some of the stuff um like when um law uh, Gary Sinise, not Gary Sinise's, but Kevin Bacon's character in the module, he's kind of getting all pissed off about, you know, what wasn't his fault, you know, defending himself. That felt pretty damn forced. Uh, but for, so that's, I mean, if I'm that's me looking for things. Uh, it's something nitpicking. you don't notice on your first dozen viewings, right? Yeah. And especially when we compare it to films like The Right Stuff that we just saw last week which was also, I mean, slightly dramatized, but still kept yeah, like, close to the realist vest. Yeah. But like, aside with from... the whole no bucks, no buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. Like, like as much as I love that scene in the right stuff, it's mm -hmm. like the dialogue does feel kind of forced. Yeah. it's But compared to other films made nowadays, dramatizations... Uh, we never, we go back to differences between Top Gun and films uh, made nowadays. No one ever was, was ever accusing Hanks of being a hot shot or Bacon. No one ever saying like to Bacon's character, this never would have happened if Gary Sinise's character had been here. Yeah, uh, you were never our first pick, and none of that. So. But they but they do play that scene like you could uh, tell that that was the inner turmoil of uh, Swagger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And, and you, they you think can... that they, they they think that if Ken was here, I wouldn't have been fucked up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it wasn't overt with it, but yeah, it did come off that way for me too. That's why I didn't quite like that whole thing. It just, mm, it didn't taste right. Yeah, but again, it's 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 added for dramatic effect, and it doesn't hurt the movie, and it doesn't hurt the story, the real story of Apollo thirteen. It's you know, this isn't like um some historical dramas like uh you know braveheart where it's mm -hmm. pretty much just the bare bones of hitting the story and then they add any everything else but i understand where you're coming from tom i, I get that i had so another thought here but I, I want you guys to give your thoughts about the film and maybe i can add my one or two little like little questions i guess uh for the group and your input so uh nigel i'll turn it to you what what are your what are some of your final thoughts on the film well this isn't so much a, on the movie this is on ron howard as a director and a storyteller i mentioned many times in the movie this is a movie i've seen a thousand times and it's based on a true story so i know the ending and i don't just mean the ending of the movie i know that all three of these guys survived and everything was okay um but just the way the movie is shot and the way the story unfolds still makes you think, God, I hope they're going to make it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you okay. really, you really don't know. And mm. uh, that's such great storytelling to be able to do that on a historical drama. That isn't a story you've made up and they didn't take that many liberties with the story. So mm -hmm. um, they just added some things for drama purposes and not, but they didn't, take away any characters they didn't take a whole lot of artistic license with how things looked mm -hmm. um they did a good job of trying to make it in early 1970 and the physics too to add to that i mean yeah the attention he did to yeah, those they, details they, they definitely don't go too deep into it but but they also don't pander 
to the point or they don't uh, have to mansplain it to the audience, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, so, we don't need to know what Delta V is when Jack Swagger, it's like, they gave us too much Delta V. It's like, you'll figure it out, you know. It's like, you don't need to know that. You just need to know that he figured out, found something that might be an issue down the road. Right. Like I said, I, I, I think that that's just really good storytelling. There's very few historical dramas that I can watch where I know how things worked out that it, even rewatching and rewatching and rewatching still keep me on the edge of my seat. Like I've seen this movie a thousand times and those last four or five minutes before they're waiting for Apollo 13 to uh, signal that they made it through re-entry. I'm still like on the edge of my seat, like watching it. Like, and you even, you guys even notice like, Dan, are you still here? I'm like, I'm just I'm really into the movie. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that was brilliant on his part too. Yeah. Like you feel like those are the four minutes that everyone in the world is waiting on. They make you feel that with them. That was, yeah. Agree. That was brilliant. Brilliant directing choice. Yeah. The, the only other movie I can think of that's a historical movie that they, that actually worked on that level. And it's probably because it's, it's not the same director, but it was the same attention to detail was the movie Gettysburg. Um, and it's because that movie was filmed on the actual battlefield and the battlefield of Gettysburg is a historical site. So it has, it looks exactly like it did in 1863. Mm-hmm. There's a scene in the movie. It's the second day of battle. It's before they're, uh, they're defending little round top and general or Colonel Chamberlain is going to order a charge because they're running out of ammo and the Confederates keep coming up the hill. Mm-hmm. And he realizes, he thinks to himself, he goes, they got to be gassed. We're gassed. We're running low on ammo. They got to be running low on ammo. Let's charge. And that scene is very well done because you still think to yourself, like, I know the historical outcome of the Battle of Gettysburg. I know that the charge worked. And I know that it's still taught in West Point to this day and all that. But you still, the way that they set that scene up, it's kind of hard to explain without showing you guys the scene bit by bit. But the way they set that scene up, you think to yourself, is this really going to work? <laughs> and that's that's what they do on Apollo 13. Like, they're waiting for them to radio in, and you're still thinking, like, oh, man, I hope they, oh, man, I hope that heat chill wasn't too damaged. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, you're still thinking to yourself, like, oh, I hope they're okay. Like, you know they're going to be okay, Dan. <laughs> You've seen the movie a thousand times. Yeah, but this might be the time where it doesn't. Yeah. Like, the movie itself is 25 years old, and the story is 40. So, like, you know they're okay. Wait, this movie came out in 95, right? Yes. So, the same amount of time has passed since the Apollo 13 happened to the movie came out as the movie came out to now. Oh, well, yeah. Oh. Did we did we actually make the anniversary of it? Are we are, are we Well, no, actually... it's June 30th or no, June It would have been April. April was the 50th, the anniversary. Oh. So yeah, it's it's been fifty years since Apollo thirteen. We were close. We got it on the year. We didn't quite uh, hit the date, but you know, happy anniversary, Apollo thirteen. Well, when did this movie come out? The other question. Might have hit the anniversary on that one. Uh, it was the Thanksgiving release, according to the trailer, which I'm playing at the beginning of this uh, podcast. Um, so we actually beat that. So we're we're pretty close to the middle. We didn't quite hit. The anniversary of the actual June event. 30th, we, 1995. Yeah, this is when it came out. So, so we are right on the money. 11 right. days off. Yeah, we're 11 right. days from it's, from the, the 20, 25th anniversary of this film. Oh, wow. Good on us. So, yeah, so the movie's 25 years old. The movie takes place in 1970. And in 1995, 1970 would have been 25 years ago. So, yeah, Josh is right. It's been the same amount of time from the movie. High five, guys. Good timing. So good. So again, it's I was off. My math was off. I said the the story itself was forty years old. No, the story is fifty years old. So again, fifty year old story, twenty five year old movie. I know the ending. Still keeps me on the edge of my seat. Yes. <laughs> Same. Just, but that's and a that's... testament to Ron Howard as a director and as a storyteller. It's just mm-hmm. so good the way he he shoots the movie. That that the subtle cues of the music, just the. The fact that the audience oh, yeah. have the same look on their face, or the uh, the the actors in the movie have the same look on their face, the audience does. Like, oh, mm-hmm. are they okay? Are they okay? Are they again, okay? again, you know, my final thoughts is uh, it's interesting how we have kind of a running theme so far, like the past uh, two-ish movies, like not Inner Space, but this one, 
right stuff and uh, Top Gun. There's no clear antagonist. Mm -hmm. Like the antagonist in this story is the environment. Yes. Similar to, you know, The Martian. Whereas the antagonist in last week, there wasn't one. It was Russia, you know? Mm -hmm. And they weren't a direct antagonist. They were just, we were competing with them. Mm -hmm. Now, Inner Space, there was an antagonist, but Top Gun, again, we even pointed that out, no antagonist. So it's like, it's interesting because the two main antagonists in this film is time and energy. You need to get the amps, energy, CO2, you know? But we slowly, <laughs> it's like, it plays out like the mission did. You know, it's like we've got, and it's like what Tom Hanks said, there's a thousand things on this list. We're on eight. You're on item 600 or 962 or whatever. Yeah. And it plays out. It's like, okay, well, we have this issue. We're going to solve it. Okay, we have this issue. We're going to solve it. Meanwhile, it's like Ken Mattingly's in the background trying to work on issue like 750. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love that aspect because they do such a brilliant job of breaking it down for the audience. Yeah, it's well, like, then that's because they also know, you know, with Ken Mattingly's part, I know that Ken Mattingly's working on problem number 750, but that's a big problem. And it we're, is. We're going to hit that milestone sooner than we'd like to admit. So yeah. we really need him working on it right now. But like, I love that, like, they build tension to it. Yeah. You know? Like, it's not like a, a Rocky montage where it's suddenly resolved after a few quick shots and music uh, overlay, you know? Yeah. They introduce that problem almost immediately after the accident. And then mm -hmm. you constantly flash back to him having troubles with it. So they build that tension. It feels like anymore they don't try to build tension. They, yeah, just, they, they, want, they, they, they just, they, they'll look at you deadpan into the camera and be like, be tense. This is hard. They don't even, even when they cut back to Ken Mattingly after they've established that that's going to be a problem. They've established they need someone working on it. They wake Ken Mattingly up. They drive him to the facility. They put him in the simulator. When they keep cutting back to Ken Mattingly, it's not to show the audience, oh, it's fixed now. He's figured it out. No, it's to show him, nope, still working on it. Like, I'm still where I'm supposed, you know. Yeah. This I've been is in hard. Hours. Space yeah. is hard. So yeah. It's like you give the audience that feeling really. of impending doom. Well, to quote Buzz Aldrin, I still remember like when SpaceX was in its infancy and they blew up one of their rockets. And it didn't even it didn't even get off the launch pad, or it barely got off the launch pad before it just exploded. And Buzz Aldrin uh, commented on Twitter. He says, "Everyone, calm down. This is literally rocket science." <laughs> <laughs> and because everyone was blasting the SpaceX thing, going, "I told you it would fail. I told you it would fail." You know, all the haters were on there, and, and Buzz Aldrin actually said, "Everyone, calm down. This is literally rocket science." Yeah. And that's what this movie is showing you. This movie is showing you this is literally rocket science. And that leads into my – now, Josh, did you have anything else? Because this, this leads into one of my questions for you guys. But uh, what other thoughts you got, to, Josh? It's been my theme to mention the music, and the music is always on point for this one. I love, like, the audio cues after, like, a, an achievement or something. It's like mm – -hmm. what was that one scene when uh, he turns back on the limb and then, like, you get that exterior shot as it pans away. And then, like, mm -hmm. just the music cue hits, like, da 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 type thing. Yeah. But no, it's just it's like this movie is a perfect storm. And I remember even being, I think it was uh, 12 when this movie came out. I remember even thinking the second half of the movie is a little bit boring. Like after they swing around the moon. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those movies, it's like it's timeless because the older I get, the more I appreciate it. Even that those scenes, you know, like it wasn't action enough for me back then, which... But nowadays, yeah. like, I like the, the pacing of this movie. I remember I was excited for this movie because I want to say at the time the movie was coming out, the Discovery Channel, back when it was still a science channel and not, you know, a channel full of dysfunctional human beings. Um, but when the Discovery Channel, I want to think it was the Discovery Channel, um, had like a special on the Apollo program, probably to promote the movie or hype the movie up a little bit because it's, you know, this was... Once again, it was a ton, big Tom Hanks movie, so it was like, you know, this was this got a lot of press and coverage. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I remember being excited to see the movie. I rode my bike up to the movie theater to go see it, and then I loved it so much that I talked my mom and dad into taking me a second time, and they went to go watch it with me, and they were like, oh, my God, this is so good. But, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I get what you're saying. I remember as a kid thinking that the second half might have been a little boring, but now that I appreciate it, it's my favorite part of the movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember recording the or playing the VHS tape to uh, my astronaut counterparts. We'd be, they'd be in the other room. We had our walkie talkies, and I'd play the launch thing. <laughs> we were playing, yeah. Nerd. You're jealous. You weren't out. You weren't playing. 
Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, but no, this this was um this is a really good film. We've watched two really great back to back movies. Yes, um, we have. You know, the bright stuff is good. Well, actually, you know, we've had a really good couple of weeks now. I mean, we the dredge that was Pathfinder is long in the uh, rear view mirror. So, oh ever, boy, uh, thank God for that. Yeah, ever I, since then, we've been entertained one week after the other. I mean, Starship Troopers and then Top Gun and uh, right stuff. Or, I mean, uh, inner space, right stuff. Then this, yeah, we've been we've been thoroughly entertained the last couple of weeks. And we're looking to get uh, equally entertained for the next one too. And then yeah. next, one, and we actually have an antagonist in the next one. Yeah, the next one we do have an antagonist. In the name of the title. The next one we do have an antagonist. And actually, I was uh, looking at next week's schedule, and I was thinking about um, a theme for the next one. And maybe we think of not bad sequels to good movies, but either good or underrated sequels to movies. Because almost everyone always derides a sequel as being worse than the original. But there's been some rare occasions where the sequel either exceeds or meets the expectations of the original. And I'm thinking of movies like Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of Nature Calls. Yeah. Alien. No. no. Alien. Aliens. Aliens, yes. Yeah. The Godfather Part 2. Although that's a long movie. But anyways, I'm just saying that there are some movies where the sequels are um, yeah. the, the original. Uh, Wrath you know, of Khan. Yeah, yeah, The Wrath of Khan. Uh, Which was last, uh, also scored by James Horner, who did this film. Yeah, uh, the Last Crusade. Yes. Yeah, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Although I maintain that Raiders of the Lost Ark is still one of the best perfect action movies I've ever seen in my life. But um, yeah, but there's a there's a, a quite a group, group of people that think The Last Crusade is the best film in the Indiana Jones quadrilogy. So anyways, but this is something to think about. We'll, we'll cross that bridge next week when we talk. But um, next week's movie is a sequel. We are going. We are taking Bill Paxton from this movie, and we are going to go and watch Predator Two. We're going to watch Bill Paxton, and I'm too old for this shit. Not Roger Murtaugh, but still Danny Glover. Uh, take on the Predator. So this uh, should be a good one. It's definitely different from the last couple movies we've watched. We've watched some nice historical dramas and historical movies and now we're going to be watching straight up sci-fi action mm-hmm. good times yep. someone's ordering the plate of nachos <laughs> it's going to get unhealthy in here <laughs> yeah yeah we're not we're not watching anything with a message to it other than uh, don't lose your head so... <laughs> ah, ah, and on that i've been tom well hang on tom did you have a little bit more Oh, no, 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 mine, I, th- I think this is a good note to end on. No, mine would have ran- mine would have been off topic and rambly. So, no, I think this is good. Okay, well, if you want to bring it up at the beginning of next week, uh, when we recap uh, Apollo 13, be my guest. I, I think we might. I think we, or just, you know, we'll figure it out. But until next time, guys, this has been awesome. I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. And thank you for listening. Yep. Good night, guys.